little appreciation. Yeah. And so we have a little tradition. I'm just going to ask them to take a, a little time to tell you about themselves and uh, their time here at Calmerta. Good evening, uh, my name is Sam Bagos. I'm the executive chef here at California Maritime Academy and I also play a role as chief steward out there in the Golden Bear. And I started here in 2000 and I did about 15 cruises, traveled with all the students and I enjoy working here and I hope you guys enjoyed your dinner and your meals earlier this morning. Yeah. Yeah. and I have been with Cal Maritime for three years now. I work in food service, also do a little bit of catering, and I also do the cruises, so we're looking forward to going out this summer, and thank you so much. Hello, my name is Trinice Preston. Um, I haven't really been here for that long. It's some very great people here. Um, I would love to be a part of this academy one day, but um, I just t turned 22 years old on the 27th of last month, and I live in Richmond. Hello, my name is Damon Gaines. I've been in the Bay Area for 36 years now, and I'm currently helping about a year and a half I've been helping out. And I'm also trading the stock market. I've been studying that for 36 years. I don't know if anybody here is trading. <laughs> that's what I currently do. And I'm, just, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> My name is Charlie Jurgens, and I've had the privilege of being here for about three weeks. It's a great group of people. <laughs> countries. We're really excited about the opportunities to travel this summer. Um, this is about 10 people short who helped prepare the meal tonight. And for those people, I will tell them thank you and pass on your blessings to them. I hope you had a wonderful evening. I'm a transplant from South Dakota, so there you go. Reverse <laughs> commute down to here. And we enjoy it and hope you had a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mark Oscar, and as, as of Monday, I've been here 10 years at CMA. Woo! I love it. Woo! And everyone treats me like family, and I love the students, I love traveling. My favorite country is Australia, so where are my Aussie boys? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and, uh, thank you very much. I also want to thank that 
great group of musicians over there who can do this. Well, we, start, we started the day early. Uh, many of you, uh, you start your day here. And you'll, uh, you'll end your day uh, here as well. We'll start again uh, earlier tomorrow morning. I'll let Sam come up and uh, make some remarks uh, uh, at the end of the uh, presentation here by our guest speaker. So it is my, my privilege uh, to introduce Mike Carkey. Uh, many of you know him. I know him as a colleague and friend uh, like you. He's a native of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Didn't mention him, but I think that's where he learned to like water. <laughs> he's, a, <laughs> he's a graduate of U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point. And he he uh, graduated in 1974, 40 years ago. So, good on you, Mike, with a bachelor's degree in marine transportation. He also uh, got an MBA from Duquesne in Pittsburgh. And that was when he was at Gulf Oil, and, um, where he was responsible for tanker operations and chartering and served as Marine Operations Manager for their uh, European business based in Great Britain. Now, following the merger of Gulf and Chevron, uh, Mike held a variety of commercial and managerial positions in the uh, international and domestic businesses, and as well as an assignment in human resources. But I'd like you to think about uh, Mike's last 12 years. Imagine yourself on September 1st, 2001, taking on the reins as the president of Chevron Shipping. And I'd like you to think about how your life has changed in the last 12 years and the challenges and the disruptions, uh, both geostrategically and in markets and in the industry that have taken place and to have a steady hand of uh, Mike Carthew at Shepherd Shipping uh, must be a blessing uh, for them. He's also a, on the board of directors for the Oil Companies International Marine Forum, where I had the privilege of meeting him while I was on active duty in the U.S. Navy five years ago when we were talking about piracy. Uh, he's also a board of director at ABS, and he has a big heart because he also serves on the U.S. Coast Guard Foundation. He's a, he's a friend of Cal Maritime and a friend of many mariners here in the Bay Area, so let me welcome Mike Carthy. Wow. Um, so I, I guess I have been in this job for a long time, and I promise you that's absolutely the best introduction I've ever had, so uh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> I'm not sure all of it's quite well deserved, but uh, we shall see. Um, so, um, uh, to begin my remarks, President Cropper, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, as Tom indicated, uh, I'm Mike Carthew, President of Chevron Shipping, a job that I've had the privilege to hold for the last 12 years. Chevron operates a fleet of 25 vessels, including U.S. flag product carriers, Aframax, Suez Max, and VLCC crude carriers, lightering ships for use here on the west coast, shuttle tankers with dynamic positioning capability, LNG ships, and FSO, FPSO storage units. As the marine arm of Chevron Corporation, uh, we're also responsible for chartering some 2,500 charters per year as we serve our system. And we get involved in just about every project across our company that has significant marine content. On an annual basis, Chevron shipping moves something like a billion barrels of oil for our system. But turning to the reason for this evening uh, in the conference over these two days, um, our topic this evening is, of course, electronic navigation. Let me be clear, however, that what we're really talking about are the use of tools that will increase our ability to keep our people safe and protect the environment. That is what this conversation is really all about. During the course of these remarks, I will try and provide some examples of how e-navigation tools could have prevented some incidents and near misses. A few of these examples might even take us off the bridge. As a hint concerning something near and dear to Admiral Cropper's heart, simulator training and competency assessment 
is certainly worth a brief discussion. What I hope you hear from me is balance. Electronic navigation is essentially a suite of tools to help the human make better decisions. Machines, no matter how sophisticated, can make all of the decisions we need to keep our people safe and protect the environment. Chevron Shipping's use of electronic navigation is growing. We strongly support the continuing development of these tools as technology advances. Some might say that, that the availability and use of electronic tools takes away from the ability of masters, watch officers, and pilots to make the decisions based on judgment and experience to properly prosecute the voyage. I beg to differ. Judgment based on experience will always be an essential part of our business. Technology's job is to put us in a position to make these decisions earlier with more accurate information. Let me spend just a few minutes on the human side of the equation. The older generation of mariners sometimes takes the view that the tools add unnecessary complexity when the ship is in the hands of an experienced navigator. On the other hand, the younger generation of mariners has an inherent advantage related to the use of technology. Essentially, they grow up with it, and they rely on it too much. The concern here is that young people will spend way too much time fooling with it, forgetting the all-important task of looking out the window. Both of these issues deserve our attention. In my company, we are focused on three things in this area. First, extensive training and certification. These tools are generally very intuitive and easy to use. Any mariner with the ability to handle radar and electronic charts easily has the ability to understand an ECTA system and other e-navigation tools. Secondly, standardization. We really don't need officers changing control attributes during the watch. We want to decide in advance what we want to use and set controls accordingly based on the expected voyage. These then become the equivalent of operating procedures which should not change without consultation and review. And third, we try to use e-navigation tools to build bridge teamwork. The captain who both shares his knowledge and experience and who is willing to listen and learn from the younger officers related to the use of technology has taken several positive steps toward creating a more positive working environment on the bridge. Overall, as I noted earlier, balance is the key. Electronic tools provide more accurate data and by doing so, support decisions based on judgment and experience. Both over-reliance and underutilization can result in less than optimal decisions. Let me get a little bit more specific and try to work in a few examples. First, e-navigation tools place more accurate data in the hands of the decision maker. We experienced a collision recently involving one of our charter ships which could have been prevented with better information. This was not, by the way, the Houston Ship Channel incident, although the circumstances are somewhat similar. The collision involved a tanker and a tug towing a string of barges, with the barge string pushed into the tanker by a significant current. AIS data on the precise location of the tug and barges in relation to the tanker, while available, was not properly displayed. Accurate current information was also not available. Verbal communications occurred, but they were inadequate as they contained next to zero information on speed, time, conditions, etc. Any of the above information should have caused the tanker to reduce speed and the tug to give the tanker a much wider berth. I am sure that we all can think of some specific information that might have made a difference in some of the more high profile incidents involving the Bay Bridge. More accurate weather information, both forward and lateral movement of the vessel, and precise current data all might have helped. With respect to the passage plan itself, we should have the technology to input a variety of information and quickly simulate a range of possible outcomes. Our mooring masters at many of our ports are beginning to use iPads on board vessels to do just that. The use of e-navigation tools as a part as part of excuse me, the use of e-navigation tools as part of the passage plan for review by watch officers, pilots, and tug captains would help
help us a great deal and also dramatically improve communications and teamwork on the bridge. Let me return to the central point. E-navigation tools support humans making good decisions. Over-reliance on technology, particularly in isolation, can be disastrous. A grounding which occurred in New Zealand was the direct result of a passage plan and course corrections that relied almost entirely on the gyro compass, which was later found to have a significant error. Secondly, e-navigation tools need to cre help us create more givens. Let me see if I can explain what I mean by that. Some time ago, we had a vessel moored to a SPM or single buoy mooring and tended by a tug in severe weather. The master on board needed to make a judgment about how much strain was on the mooring assembly in order to make proper use of the ship's engines as well as to, proper to properly utilize tugboat support. The mooring assembly, assembly actually parted, putting the ship and particularly the tug in danger. The key question is, why should the strain on the mooring assembly be a judgment? We should have the technology available to specifically measure the tension on the mooring assembly and compare it directly to its rated capacity. And finally, we've introduced ECTUS on the bridge of our ships. So far, with particular emphasis on training, we are finding that the integration and logical presentation of the data available at a glance is creating more time to monitor the external environment and more confidence that our exact positions, courses, and future decision points are well understood and properly supported with accurate data. A heads-up display of pertinent information could go even further toward keeping us focused outside where the real danger exists. All electronic tools are not located on the bridge. I believe, for example, that we must make much more extensive use of simulator training. Historically, those that make use of simulators have done so mainly for training purposes as well as to enhance bridge team management. These will continue to be very important. Two other areas deserve our attention. First, let's get the pilots and tugboat captains in, his, in the simulator with the bridge team. This will further enhance teamwork, establish better communications, and perhaps most importantly, help us to learn to create a shared mental model for the passage about to take place among those involved particularly the master and the pilot. Second, similar to the airline industry, we need to regularly assess the competency of our people by use of simula simulators to objectively verify that the skills that we think we have on the bridge and in the engine room are actually available to us. Chevron Shipping is working closely with Tom and his team here at Cal Maritime to accomplish these objectives. So let me conclude these brief remarks by once again returning to our most important priorities. Our job is to keep our people safe and to protect the environment as we conduct our business in the shipping industry. I strongly believe ele electronic navigation puts us in a much better position to do just that. To the extent that they bring the bridge team together with better teamwork, more accurate data, and enhanced communications, we will have the ability to reduce and maybe even eliminate the serious incidents which occur all too frequently in our industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for a very uh, illuminating and informative uh, uh, speech there. I, I think this is, you can all tell, this is the president of a major shipping company that gets it. Anybody that would like to ask any, any questions, uh, Mike, uh, please. Uh I also have a team of people from Chevron back there, so you can ask them questions as well. <laughs> <laughs> they can, they always do. <laughs> you can't ask questions if you want. Tell us about the, uh, what did you see as some initial successes in your competency evaluations? Um, so far, I, well, I'll, first I'll start with what we've started to try to overcome. Uh, the, first, the, the first thing that we had to overcome was that it was a test to determine um, uh, whether uh, a captain 
the chief engineer, chief mate, first assistant was going to continue to be employed. So there's a fear factor that once we introduce competency assessments, that we were going to use it as a way to uh, fire people. And they basically, they told me that uh, directly. So basically what we did is we brought in uh, a group of our best captains and best chief engineers. Uh, we started to put them through the competency assessment and uh, we made it very clear and asked them to make it very clear that we weren't interested in uh, what the final score was at the end of the competency assessment. We were interested in identifying gaps uh, in their knowledge that we could basically review with them and put them through additional training to close those gaps. In other words, get them involved in refresher courses, refresher training, and other, we have a, part of the reason that we have so many folks up at the conference is that we have a, a major effort that's focused on marine learning and development. And we have a whole variety of tools that we can make use of to train our people if we can only figure out what those priorities should be. So what we're using the competency assessment process for is to help us determine specifically individual by individual what those training priorities uh, would be. We did have, uh, just for your information, we did have one captain that failed uh, and we, th we thought that that would create uh, a bit of a stir. Uh, it did not. Basically, his attitude toward it was that um, he didn't do as well as he could have and that he was very interested and very willing. Uh, to do some training in order to bring the areas that were identified as part of the competency assessment uh, back up to scratch. So, so far so good. It's been very positive at the captain and chief engineer level. We'll have to see how it works as you move down through the organization because that fear factor might uh, raise its head uh, once again as we move lower into the organization. We're looking at competency and skills development not whether you should be working for the company. Maybe that's the, the best way to say it. Sir. Yes, <clears throat> you've talked very eloquently on the safety aspect of e-navigation, and congratulations for that, very well done. Do you actually see e-navigation as a tool to bring efficiency to your company, or are you only look at looking at it from a safety point of view? Well, I, I, I have to say that we're starting the process of looking at it from a safety and environmental protection point of view. However, um, to your point, I think that when you take it when you take it back a little bit further, when you take it to the passage plan, when you take it to the conversation that should be taking place on board between the pilot and the captain related to the passage plan that's expected, and then if you take it and back it up even further in a company like mine into the voyage management process where you're actually planning the voyage, moving the ships around, looking at the whole picture related to uh, what the fleet is doing uh, and where it should be positioned. Um, I think there are some applications from an efficiency point of view uh, that will also be available to us. Sorry. Question about your charter fleet. You have explained that you, you have pretty good control over your own fleet. Uh, how much control do you have over the charter fleet? You know, it varies. Um, I, I, I break it down into two broad categories. Um, uh, in addition to our operated fleet, uh, we have a large number of time charters uh, where we enter into period business uh, with people that we know and respect. Um, I can't give you the exact number, but I would say that probably 80% of our time charter business is with four or five companies. People that we like and respect and who have similar values to what we uh, try to espouse when it comes to safety and environmental protection. From a voyage charter basis, we do something similar. We have a very large clearance and vetting department who actually gets out and on board a lot of chartered ships. We do a full detailed audit of every owner that we deal with. We do ship inspections. Uh, we have a marine superintendent's program that gets people on board third party ships. Again, for the purpose of finding those companies that we think line up with what we're trying to accomplish with our own operated fleet. Is it perfect? It's not. Um, you know, quite frankly, right at the moment, it's very difficult. Um, uh, for If there are, is anyone in the room in the tanker business, I'm sorry for you from a financial point of view. Um, uh, tanker markets are very overbuilt and um, 
The result of that is that the returns on a tanker uh, in the tanker market are very low at the present time. We've actually increased the number of people that we have looking at ships basically out of a concern that if a company isn't making any money or isn't breaking even, uh, they're not going to have the money to invest in their maintenance programs, they're not going to have money to invest in training, uh, and we're going to find ourselves in a situation, like I said in my remarks, where we might not quite have on board that ship what we're expecting to have on board uh, related to conditions uh, in the marketplace. So it's a big concern uh, right now. It's, it's, it's a funny thing for a charterer to say, but it's always been my view that I'd like to see all of the owners make a little bit of money so that they're in a position to do the things that they need to do to maintain their assets and train their people. basically going into the office, spending some time with the people that are running the company, and see what they're all about. Um, I think that any company uh, that cares does have in place the kind of training programs that will put people in a position uh, to be successful on board ship. Now I admit that a lot of those companies have not taken steps toward moving into electronic navigation in a, good, in a big way because basically, at least at this point, um, in a market where the economics are tough, unfortunately, people sometimes only move when they're forced to move by regulation. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the basic seamanship skills, the basic navigation skills, uh, and the talent that companies have in the engine rooms uh, can be very objectively determined by a good audit program, a good audit process, including an audit of their training and development programs, which at the end of the day, uh, most, most all good shipping companies uh, do have in place. Uh, it's also why I said that we strictly limit the number of companies that we deal with, and we strictly limit our exposure to the spot market so that we have the resources to go look at the people that we're dealing with to be sure we understand exactly, uh, exactly what we have. Uh, so, if you think of all of the ships that are available in the spot market on a scale of 1 to 100, we're probably using 10 or 15 percent of those, basically because we don't have the desire or the resources to get out and do a full industry audit. We're more focused on our own needs and trying to identify a short list of companies that we would prefer to do a lot of business with. Those companies would, I think, have the kind of training and development and also maintenance and engineering programs and modernization programs that would put them in a position uh, to be successful. Again, uh, electronic navigation is a tool to assist the decision maker. The basic skills related to seamanship, navigation, marine engineering uh, are, the, are the most important thing and they're the first thing that we look at when we're trying to decide whether to do uh, business with a new company. Yes. Oh, she's with the Chevron guy. She can ask those questions. <laughs> I don't know them. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, I don't either, actually. So go ahead. Yeah. I appreciate what you said about uh, the VRM training, including the tugs and the pilots. Yes. And the bridge crew. And being an academic, I have to excuse myself because I have to ask you a leading question. Okay. The, the, the team of this is e-navigation, but do you see any? benefit of including the engineering crew in that BRM training? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
you know, very honestly, um, the, um, the the engineers, um, the engineers, when you think about their responsibilities that have the potential to uh, negatively impact the navigation of the ship, are tremendous. I'm not sure whether that directly uh, is where you were going. I was actually on one of our ships. Um, uh, Phil would remember, I don't really remember where I am day to day, but I was on one of our ships a few months ago where we actually had um, a ship that was about to come alongside to perform a lightering operation and they had a steering gear failure right in the middle of the operation. Uh, the chief engineer was on the bridge talking to the captain uh, and talking to the other officers about exactly what needed to be done to get the ship back, literally back, uh, into a seaworthy condition with a, a dysfunctional steering gear. So e-navigation, the word navigation applies, applies to the bridge, but if you think of all of the equipment that could get you in trouble, if you look at things like steering engines, um, we have major uh, simulator training for our engineers. Uh, we have a major reliability program. In fact, I was just talking to our engineers today about uh, what we refer to as a a blackout reduction program where we're having we're having a lot of generator failures and part of the reason is uh, part of the reason is human uh, and it's because we're getting a lot of new technology in the engine room and um, I'm not sure that all of our engin engineers necessarily clearly understand what's going on behind that board so we're getting we're having some blackouts and I, I know we have a San Francisco Bay pilot here uh, coming into San Francisco Bay, there have been a lot of ships coming relatively close to the Golden Gate Bridge that have had blackout problems because of fuel switching and all sorts of other reasons. So there are huge technology applications, huge training applications, simulator, uh, simulator applications, and, and quite frankly, the engineer that at least has a working knowledge of what's going on up on the bridge is in a much better position to deal with the bridge team when something goes wrong. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Fifteen years ago in Canada, uh, Canada was one of the early implementers of electronic charts, particularly in the Great Lakes. Right. Canada's steamship lines had a chief of operations named John Pace. And when asked, when John was asked one time, why in the hell is CSL implementing electronic charts? How are you saving any money? And he said, young man, we're not saving money, we're making money. What's the situation with Chevron? If I'm a stockholder, are you saving money or making money by implementing e-navigation? Well, um, I, I guess um, there's a couple different ways to answer that. Um, uh, basically, um, at the end of the day, we're um, uh, probably the, the, the highest level way to answer it would be that I happen to run a shipping company that's embedded within a major oil company. Um, if you think of the ramifications of a major oil spill to an oil company, you would do anything to prevent that. Anything. Like Exxon Valdez, for instance. Well, I mean, that's obviously the classic example, but very honestly, in this day and age, um, even a small spill uh, can do tremendous harm to, it, it obviously does tremendous harm to the shipping company, but in our case, it also significantly damages our reputation. So all over the media, at the public, everything is affected by that. So basically, Chevron's view has always been that um, uh, from a, a cost point of view, the business proposition related to both keeping people safe and protecting the environment has always been worth it. And um, um, we're very fortunate people to have senior management like Chevron uh, who basically uh, takes that view. When we went to Chevron uh, just last year to talk to them about uh, installing simulators in four of our offices and building a learning and development simulator, as well as working with Tom and Cal Mariton, and we went through the data related to cost and explained to them that you know better trained people driving the lightering ships in San Francisco Bay uh, was going to be the outcome of this work, they were, okay, fine. I mean, that's what we expect you to do. Um, and, you know, I, and I, 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 guess, um, I guess I'll tell you one other thing about Chevron since you asked. You, you'll, you'll learn very quickly that I'm very proud of the company and the way it operates. Um, back a few years ago, uh, 2007, 2008, um, Chevron shipping was operating in a very high market. 
very high tanker market, and we were making lots of money uh, with our tanker fleet, as were all shipping companies uh, at that time. When I did my annual review of the chairman, uh, the chairman's message was, please begin your presentation with what you're doing to keep our people safe and protect the environment. Last year when I did my review in the diametric opposite of that good market, when I sat down with our chairman, the conversation was exactly the same. It's been the focus for a very long period of time because at the end of the day, the consequences, well, the consequences of somebody getting hurt for any reason should be unacceptable to everyone. And the consequences of our being involved in a major environmental event um, are also uh, either very negative, at least very negative, and in certain situations, catastrophic uh, to the corporation. So much so that the attitude is, there's no excuse for having an oil spill related to saving money. And certainly there's no excuse related to having an injury uh, related to saving money. Try that and um, uh, your speaker next year will be somebody other than me. How about that? <laughs> if, if Tom invites me back, I won't presume that. So. Jason Tom of Coast Guard. Uh, thank you, sir. And I uh, had the pleasure of working with your folks here in the San Francisco Bay Area and been very impressed with the uh, commitment to safety and the culture of the company. So congratulations. Well, thank you. To From the Coast Guard, that's, uh, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do have a question. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, bringing pilots into your training for BRM, which is, a, a, from my perspective, a fantastic idea. Right. One of the things that came up today, how do you see um, electronic navigation impacting uh, BRM? Um, BRM continues to be a, a real challenge, particularly in piloted waters where we still, despite uh, improvements in technology, we still see uh, incidents that are related to human error, BRM failures, etc. How do you see electronic navigation impacting that, and, and what kind of steps can we take to, to improve that as, as this new technology comes online? Thank you. Well, um, yeah, yeah I, I guess the, from my point of view, um, at the end of the day, um, uh, maybe the way I would address that is that um, um, we have, although there have been some high profile incidents, uh, if you look at the number of voyages that we make, uh, the volume of oil that we carry, uh, the number of times uh, even my company goes across San Francisco Bay, uh, we have very few incidents overall. Uh, Zero is good. Um, but even at the end of the day, there really are very few, and the high-profile ones tend to sometimes make it seem like uh, there's a whole lot more. So I guess from my point of view, part of the reason to get uh, to ask our pilot friends and our tugboat captains to get uh, to work with us from a training point of view is really two things. Uh, one, um, we're not having that many incidents, which tends to mean that people aren't dealing with difficult situations very often, so that when one does happen, they don't know what to do. So what you want to do is, if you, and I know you have Commander, uh, I think it was Commander, right? Yes. Um, um, if, if you're involved in an incident, whether you're on a ship or whether you're, you do what I'm sure you've done and what I've done, and that's be an incident commander, the first five or six things that you do when something goes wrong are almost automatic. The issue is when you're operating in an environment where you're not really having very many bad things happen, there can be either a lack of knowledge related to those things or, and I'll use this word, a bit of complacency related to what to do when something starts to go wrong. So I see that simulator training part of this as a means to get us together so that we both understand each other better, those actors, if you will, on the bridge of a ship, that we drill in routine situations as well as difficult situations, so that whenever we get to the point where we are involved in the middle of a difficult situation and maybe we have a pilot on board or a mooring master or something's going wrong, it won't be the first time that we've seen it. I'm not saying for a minute that a simulator is the real thing. But at the end of the day, it does put you in a position to start acting quicker than you might otherwise have done if you can get people involved in an environment where the situation that they're now facing is not completely unfamiliar. I also think that, from I'll speak for myself and my own captains and chief engineers, 
A lot of the things that we do in the shipping industry are very routine. I think, and I'm obviously prejudiced, but I think we have some of the best people in the industry on our ships. But the, the, as good as they are and as capable as they are, they can still fall into that every operation is routine, it's not that dangerous, we'll get out of this, and they, they basically start a job with somewhat of a complacent attitude in such a way that they, that they just start working, they don't look around at the environment, they certainly don't do what, what we're trying to suggest that we do all the time, and that is that when you begin an operation, before you even start, step back from the operation, get your people together, be sure everybody's prepared, and then do one more thing. Discuss the worst thing that could happen associated with that operation, and then decide whether you're prepared for that eventuality. If you're coming across the bay, it's grounding. Um, are you prepared for that? What other safety devices or tests can you do to prevent that event from taking place? So we're trying to get our people more up on their toes even when they're involved in routine operations because at the end of the day, everybody in this room knows as well as I do, this business, can, this business doesn't seem all that dangerous sometimes, but it can get extremely dangerous in one heck of a hurry. So that's one of the reasons that I think doing more of this uh, is important. And, and I'll tell you one other thing. When I went out to that lightering operation and uh, the steering gear failure occurred, um, you can imagine how pleased they were that I was on board when they had a steering gear failure. <laughs> they were very happy about that. But so after they were done, and I didn't, I didn't say a word during the whole thing, that's not my job. But I did afterward get the whole team together for a debrief. You know what the first trip captain said? First trip captain said uh, in our debrief? He said, I went through a simulator exercise where we had a steering gear failure. He said, it was really different than the simulator, but it wasn't the first time I saw it. And I thought that was a good example of a young captain relying on his training, and I watched him very carefully. <laughs> he was brilliant, he really was. He did a wonderful job of assuming command in that situation. And he was just in a situation where he got himself into a situation, but he had seen it before, he was more calm, more decisive, more looking at the big picture rather than pushing buttons and reacting, as sometimes happens when things start to go wrong. So I, I guess that's what we're, we're really fighting against. Very, very highly trained people who can get a little bit complacent when things go very well for a long period of time. Sorry, that's too long an answer, but it's okay. <laughs> Sir, Alicia Johnson, King's Point. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you, you talked about evaluation and also about training. Um, if any of those paradigms need to change as we start dealing with kids my age rising up through the ranks and coming up to chief mate, chief engineer, uh, and especially with complacency and our familiarity with e-navigation systems, seeing as how we're being trained on them right now while we're still in school. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think fundamentally um, uh, the thing that we're doing uh, first and foremost related to that is asking people like you uh, related to that. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I've been with Chevron 40 years. I haven't been to sea for a very, very long time. And I think that basically the older generation almost always thinks that the younger generation needs to be quicker, smarter, faster, or those sorts of things. And by the way, that's wrong. So I think what we need to do is um, we need to get younger people involved, younger officers, third assistants, second assistants, second mates, third mates, get them involved. And so what we're doing is that we have younger people like that involved in our training activities so that they're on the teams that are putting together the training so they can look at it themselves. Uh, I think the other thing that we need to be sure is that, that we're, we're clear on expectations. Uh, we can see circumstances where uh, you will have young people that basically come on board with a view that they can uh, uh, take a third mate's job spend a little bit of time, qualify for second mate, move up to chief mate, and pretty soon, five years later, they're going to be on the bridge of a ship as captain. And so basically what we try to do to deal with expectations is that we try to outline for a young person what we think. We could be wrong. We could be a little bit off. But we try to outline what their whole career looks like. So how long is it going to take 
a third mate who starts tomorrow, how long is it going to take to be captain? What steps do we need to take to get you ready for that? We have a very uh, comprehensive and growing uh, learning and development process. We call it MMS, um, which basically, if you come into our company as a third mate, it will give you chapter and verse of what you need from Chevron's point of view to qualify to be second mate. What you need to do to be qualified to be chief mate. Uh, and so we want to go through that to be sure that your expectations and our expectations uh, match up uh, very clearly. We also want to listen to you when it comes to the use of technology because you're better at it than we are. You really are better at it than we are, and I'm not just saying that. Um, uh, when we, looked at, when we look at e-navigation tools, we get some of our junior officers involved and have them look at it because at the end of the day, they're better at it. As I said in my uh, remarks earlier, you grew up with it, the older generation did not. So I, I think it's a matter of, 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 of being sure that we do our best to, to not look at the third mate short term, look at the third mate long term, and be sure that we have both an outline of a career development program for that person, and then along with that career development program, perhaps realistic expectations related to what needs to be accomplished to get there to be sure that we kind of stay linked up uh, when it uh, when it comes to that, I hope that's a that is your question. Yes. Okay. One more. One more. One more. This is it. Yeah. This has been fabulous, and, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, just a comment uh, to your uh, question about engineers, and uh, I just thought I'd, I'd bring up the fact that on, on board the Golden Bear, I was very happy to see I'm, I'm the captain of the Golden Bear, and. Uh, down in the engine room, we have a, a very large flat screen TV that has an Ectus monitor on it, and also a bow cam and side cams. So communication is so important with the engineers that we, we actually, they can see in real time where the ship is, and if they want to switch the channel and say, hey, what's going on up there? Why is the captain giving a full stern? They can actually, oh, you know, we're, we're approaching the dock too fast. So I, I think that integrating the engineers with VRM, that's a great way to do it, a very simple way to do yep. it, is to put monitors in the engine sure. room. Yep. And my previous command before I came here, we did the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and I have to admit, about 15 years ago, we moved the Ectus down and we put a monitor in the engine room. I was a little nervous about it. What's that? Didn't know anything, yeah, we, uh, we didn't know anything about what I'm doing, but it, I, I welcomed it. It was great. They love it. And they can switch from bow cams to side cams to Ectus and know exactly what we're doing at any given time. Yep. So it's yep. another part of communication. Sure. Very simple, yep. cheap fix. So, so I guess the only other thing I would add then is we, we also do maybe one thing that it may be a little bit different, uh, and that is that, yes, we have the traditional captain and chief engineer. Um, um, but what we call them is uh, we actually have two captains and two chief engineers for each ship. And we call that group of four a vessel management team. And so basically, in addition to everything else, we have that group of four, even when the other two are on vacation, involved in the communications, the email traffic, the maintenance plans, and all that kind of stuff, so that that group of four is essentially managing the ship together. The chief engineer is sitting down with the captain to review the budget for the next dry dock. That's sent to the chief engineer that's off to get comments. So we're trying to make uh, the senior officers uh, on board the ship more a functioning team rather than uh, let them fall back into the more hierarchical structure that basically has sort of kept captains and chief engineers apart for a long period of time. That togetherness on the vessel management team does create some of that knowledge because, you know, I, I visit our ships all the time and I always meet, I always meet jointly with the captain and chief, not separately, and I see whenever I go on board, I see the captain and chief together. I mean, I've gone on board ship and gone up to the bridge to see the captain, and the chief engineer's up there talking to the captain. That's the, what we want from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of managing the ship.
back any time. Apparently, I have to let Tom know. Oh, okay. You have to let him know. <laughs> okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a, a wonderful day today. Um, I think it, uh, it was uh, certainly a very interesting day. Uh, a couple of uh, real um, interesting and uh, provocative uh, question and answer periods after our, after our speakers. And I hope that continues tomorrow. We have a full day plan tomorrow as well. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, announcements of the schedule to remind you. Uh, the buses will be leaving here uh, for about, at about uh, a quarter after nine tonight to head back to the hotel. So I think you have plenty of time to make that. Um, first thing in the morning, we're going to be, again, 0700 uh, buses will be leaving the, uh, the hotel and, uh, and another one at 730. We're going to have a uh, cadet formation at uh, 7.15 to 7.30, and I hope that all of you uh, would like to come and, and see uh, our wonderful cadets out there on at formation on the quad. Uh, we will have uh, our uh, normal breakfast here, and then we'll start promptly at 8.30. Uh, we have, uh, tomorrow is going to be a, a, a little bit different organization. We're going to have co uh, co uh, concurrent sessions, uh, both in RISA and in the uh, Teachman Lecture Hall. So please uh, look in your uh, programs. There's a sheet there that tells you the concurrent sessions, which one is which. Um, feel free to go back and forth between them, but I, I urge you to not, if possible, not walk in in the middle of a session and disturb the session that's going on. So if you're going to be moving back and forth uh, between the two lecture halls in the concurrent sessions, please be uh, mindful of that. Um, if there is anybody that has any questions for me, I have, uh, I'll, be glad to entertain any questions now about the conference, uh, if I can, while we're here. And if not, then I will uh, see you in the morning. All right, right now. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you.